Okay, if we could bring the lights up a little bit more so we can see the people here. They're getting some chairs right here. Thank you. So, well, <laughs> I hardly know where to begin. Um, let me start by asking you to talk a little bit, uh, your own sort of thoughts and feelings about this idea of consciousness, the replicability of consciousness, the desirability of attempting to replicate consciousness, um, and is that the thing that finally separates forever humans and machines? That's a really big question. Um, it, it, consciousness, this section where one of the early parts of the film or that you saw was on tackle the idea of consciousness and, and replicating consciousness or creating a new consciousness in machines. And the reason why I went down that path and, and showed it is because I, when I first started making this film and doing a lot of research, I talked to many people in the technology world and a lot of people said, okay, as soon as we have this many cycles, the same number of cycles in a computer that we have in a brain, then we'll have the intelligence of a brain in a computer. And, and it's like, okay, well, my watch is intelligent and my laptop's intelligent then, but it just sits there. It has no feeling. And what makes us unique, in my opinion, is the fact that we can experience, that we have feelings, that we have consciousness. So a lot of people that I talk to in the tech world, they don't go there. A, they don't want to answer it. Maybe it's because they can't. Some people really gloss over it and go, oh yeah, it's not even an issue because these machines will have their own consciousness. I'm not sure. Um, but I approach that because for me as a filmmaker, as an artist, as a, as a human being living on this world, consciousness is all that I have, um, as well as my wife. Love my wife. But I love my consciousness, and then I love my wife because I have consciousness. Right. So I, t I went down that road. Is that what makes us unique as humans? I'm not sure. It's one of the things, though. Well, and I was kind of intrigued by the idea of trying to replicate that. Like, is that replicatable? I, is it replicable? I'm not sure. And, and one thing that was interesting, I, uh, you saw Alison Gopnik. She's, uh, um, uh, she, she works at UC Berkeley, and, and she's trying to understand what consciousness is. She works with babies. And, and it used, she, she's of the feeling that um, belief that babies have consciousness that's just different from adults and that maybe computers will have consciousness but it's just different from what we the way we experience right so right. I'm not sure if it can be replicated and if there is a consciousness that a machine has whether it's going to be the same as ours right Okay, so another thing that struck me that I thought was kind of interesting, which seems, at first glance, seems like a minor point, but the more I thought about it, the more intrigued I became by it, is the idea of, of touch and feel, and that the, the, the hunk of metal can never actually have a relationship, if you will, because it doesn't have the, you know, he was talking about, you know, it's not furry and soft and all of that sort of thing, which, which leads me to think, well, then, isn't there some aspect of sens sensualness, sensory experience that goes well beyond just the mechanics of the brain that's about uh, you know, this idea of compu ro computers becoming robots, becoming human? Absolutely, and, and so the guy that said that, Wolf Singer, he is so opposed to the idea of there being conscious machines or ever being a singularity when there's uh, computers that are smarter than us. Um, but. Paul Sappho, who you saw in the film, also says, you know, but look, you know, we're now at the point where we're having sense, our computers are, are becoming sense aware. Very simply right now, but you would assume over the next bunch of years, they'll become more and more sense aware, so they will feel, maybe like we feel, maybe different from the way we feel, but they will have feeling, touch, sensory feelings, and um, maybe that will help create or at least affect their consciousness. Right. So as an, an artist who's working with this idea, so what's your, how are you thinking about this? You know, when I started this film, I was so gung-ho about the idea that this, there's gonna be these awesome computers that um, are better than us. And then the more I did research into this and started talking to people, shooting the film, um, it scared me more and more that life is gonna be very different. I mean, life is very different from, from uh, 
the advent of, of technology um, and computer technology. There's issues that are raised. When we can start engineering change, um, it's not that everybody is going to be able to afford to have that same change. So it used to be that anybody could be the smartest person in the world. But one day down the road, only those people that can afford that change will be the smartest people to, in, in the world. So it used to be that a poor person could be just as smart as a rich person. Maybe not so in the future. That's a horrible thought to me. Um, so there's great things that come from technology. At the same time, there's, this is a pretty scary thing. That's one aspect of it. The other is, you know, will these machines be friendly to us? Will these machines treat us as, as pets or food? Or are they going to simply be integrated with us? I don't have the answer to that. We don't know. These are just guesses. So it's, it's awesome. At the same time, it's really scary. Yeah, I was struck by this. I, you sort of touched on this a little bit, um, this idea that we, you know, when he was talking about, well, you know, we didn't used to know that, that the reason that it was, it was my brain that could make my hand do this as opposed to a rock. Why does a rock just sit there? And, and sort of the whole evolution of knowledge, right, over centuries of human endeavor and thinking, well, then maybe there's an idea, like you were saying about the woman in Berkeley, maybe there's an idea of consciousness that we're not conscious of, that we don't even know about, that would ultimately make itself manifest over some period of time. Well, absolutely. We like to think that we know everything, and the state of knowledge of right. the, the world that we have is, is it. But we have learned always that what we know is very limited, and right. what's, what we know down the road is, is, is much greater. It's much greater. Yeah. The other thing that struck me, and then I want to open this up to the artists to hear what you, your response is, particularly in relationship to your own creative work, um, I was struck by the sort of moral dilemma that the guy posed about, well, suppose, you know, I have my first child and you know, I don't do anything, but now three years later I go to have my second child and now I can sort of genetically engineer, make the, some of these choices. And, um, you know, he posed it as the question about, you know, what, you know, the Windows 95 illusion. So, you know, this child gets left in the dust. But also to me then there's also this moral dilemma, well, do I really want to have this super smart child? Do, do I really want the responsibility of making that decision of the child being super smart or super attractive or, and will it, you know, how far down that road does it go where it's, it starts, you know, parents are genetically selecting what others might consider to be less uh, desirable traits in their children. Like, I want, I want a really aggressive girl who's going to like kick butt, you know, kind of thing, or I want to, you know, wh whatever people decide they, it's a, it becomes a huge moral question, don't you think? Absolutely, there's a, there, there's a lot to that. What, what strikes me the most about that notion of engineering change with our children is that we're connected to our children and to our, our parents, to our ancestors, both forward and, and back. I mean, I, when I was looking into the notion of consciousness, every philosopher, person in, in the study of consciousness would say, you know what, I know I'm conscious, but I don't know if you're conscious. I don't know that for a fact. I will assume you're conscious just because you are the same as me. So if I'm conscious, then I'll assume that you're conscious. But as soon as we start to engineer change, I can't make that same assumption anymore so that we don't have that connection right, right. forward and back. So it's not, so it, it's, it's, my kid might not be the same as me. I might not have that same connection and I might not view the, that person in the world the same way. And so that's, that's a weird thought. Let's see, let me uh, um, ask um, if uh, any of you an artists sitting in the first couple rows, if you've had some response to what you've heard. David? Um, so I think a lot about technology and art, um, working on a project, working with scientists around nanotechnology research and how to deal with that. Um, it brings me to ethics. I've sort of come around to this idea of ethics and ethics training for people. Um, and I'm really interested to hear Jaron Lanier talk, because I love you. And, we all uh, are. <laughs> and uh, there's a certain idea of ethics in your thinking that I think is, um, we don't get trained in necessarily, um, or is sort of downplayed. And I think ethics is a word in a lot of, it's in business and politics and whatever, but I think it's become a quickly become a really important word in our society. Um, 
I'm about to have a kid, and I've, there's already options around genetically choosing how that kid may or may not turn out, which is, I mean, it's, it's here already, I guess, is a thing. It's like this is, the, the horizon is not, it, it's, not we're on the horizon line, and, and we're having to make these decisions already, and the, I think it's really interesting and important for us as artists or to charge the room to think about, um, you know, th this is going on, it's not sort of perpetually in the future, um, and how do we bring some attention to it, and I'm really pleased to see this film and interested to see what the total stance of the film is on the end, because I know there's a lot of questions. It's, it becomes very hard to make a film or to make a piece that sort of takes a stance, and I imagine 10 years is only the beginning of that process, but, um, I don't know if there's a question there, but just to think about... Well, let me ask you, because you are, do work in, with technology in your work, what, are there specific ethical questions that you're encountering in doing your work that are giving you, at least giving you pause? Uh, well, I think the, the point is to pause. You know, I think the point is to create a space to think and to, to question the patterns that you're presented with and are expected to drop into the patterns of your email account and the patterns of your lifestyle and workflow and food and um, so to me it's about using the work and the sort of opportunity we have as artists to create an intervention to create pause. Right. Um, I I, it's hard for me to value one reaction to the options. Do you find, you, do you find yourself saying, whoa, too much, I need to like, I'm going in a direction I don't want to go or, or you just keep moving particular direction to see what happens in relationship to your work in technology I'm thinking as a practicing artist yeah I mean, well I try and use everything that's available as a way to point to what's available right um, yeah okay that's good that's good <laughs> that's good that's yeah I was, I'm just uh, kind of intrigued so many artists, including many in this room, are you know deeply deeply involved with technology in the work that you're doing, right? So is it a la what he's what a couple of these people are talking about? Well, it's an extension of humanity, right? It's another tool. It's just a paintbrush only. It's different, right? Or is there something deeper and more serious going on there? Yeah. Well, just to follow to think two seconds longer. I think, I also work in performance, and I think that the point is to butt technology up against real life, or, or present tense happening right now, so you can, in the moment, see those two things acting on each other. You can see a person having to deal with their phone, and, the, and that that creates a tension and an awareness about the need to deal with your phone. And that's the role of the artist. I mean, certainly, technologists will do what they do because they have a desire to create things, to move things forward. And there's certainly a lot of organizations in the technology world, Singularity Institute for Artificial Intelligence, they're trying to examine some of these eth ethical issues. But I think the role of the artist is to really question not just technology, but all aspects of life, and, and pose it to themselves, to the public, to their friends. And it's, it's, it's a great benefit to us viewing anybody's art, whatever the media is, because it helps us raise the questions, address the issues, not necessarily have the answers. There is no right answer, but it's the artist raises these questions where technologists don't always get to because they're advocates. Well, I think there's, yeah, David, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I had a couple thoughts. Uh, this was really provocative and wonderful, so thank you so much. Um, uh, the, I, just this morning, I was sort of flipping through Facebook, and I saw this headline um, of an article a friend posted. It said, Earth, Earth makes it clear that it wants us to go away, um, <laughs> which I thought was interesting. And I was, as I was coming over here, I was thinking about, wow, so d is Earth actually a con Does Earth have consciousness, like the Gaia hypothesis? And I was wondering if that's a theme that comes up in your work. But, um, well, I have another question, but I'll let you answer it. Go ahead. Uh, it's not something that I address. Uh, in my film. I mean, the film goes on for another hour, uh, 40 minutes, um, and it doesn't address that, but, but I mean, just think of standing on, at the beach and, you know, the magnitude of waves relative to you. The Earth is a lot bigger than you, you know? So I'm not sure if the Earth has consciousness that we know as consciousness, but the Earth is certainly bigger than us. 
Well, but that could be one of those consciousnesses, like she was saying in the film, right? That could be one of those uh, consciousnesses that we're not conscious of, yeah, right? Absolutely. We don't understand the consciousness of the earth. I mean, I could, yeah. I could totally see that. What yeah. was your other question? Um, well, I was wondering also, I was thinking about uh, these other aspects of consciousness or personality or ethics or morality, like um, the desire for community or like the relationship with your wife that you have or uh, altruism um, and just sort of how humans interact with each other and how different it actually is even within subgroups of humans, um, you know, minus all the alterations. And I guess I was wondering if like, you know, are the Japanese researchers who are developing artificial intelligence, are they going to create politer versions of artificial intelligence than the American <laughs> ones? I mean, or, or it, you know, where's the space in this? Do you explore that, like the different, the, those, those aspects? No, that's, that's an awesome study though. Um, because I'm certain there's a difference, because we all bring to the table our own uh, sense of morality, uh, whether it's, you know, it's how we were raised or just the, you know, the, the way we have adapted uh, over our, our years of living, but we all bring something different to the table. That's a, that's a really interesting study. Yeah, I'm over here. I like the, the comment about the more polite Japanese artificial intelligence, because, um, I think the thing that I'm struggling with is that I, I, watching this film and sort of trying to absorb where these studies are coming from and what's the genesis of this kind of thinking, it, it feels very economically rooted to me. There's kind of like a socioeconomics that I'm seeing amongst the people and the colleagues that I see on the screen that I'm making a slew of assumptions about, but that feel very far away from my reality, I guess. Um, I don't really know what my question is. I guess I'm trying to figure out, um, if this kind of course of study in this line of questioning is sort of socioeconomically rooted, like how is it actually useful for artists who kind of create meaning in an alternative economy because they have to, because they, you know, they're, they're not in sort of a mainstream economy. Like I think even terms like intelligence, I mean, we create terms to reflect what's useful for us about them, right? So like the, even operationalizing a term like intelligence amongst the folks that I'm seeing on the screen, um, it's very different from the way I think about intelligence. And then you had made the comment of like, who can afford to be smarter once this nanotechnology advances? And I think operationalize the term smart because we really do, we recreate terms like intelligence based on what we have access to and what's important to us right now. Um, I get, so then like the idea of, you know, the, the, the baby being the most kind of blank machine and most comparable to a modern day computer or contemporary computer. And then I think, okay, well what happens when constructivism kicks in and that, that baby becomes an adult and sociology is laid on top of that baby. And um, I think just a really interesting phenotypical example from watching the film was that the one person that sort of was a voice of dissent in certain terms of saying like, I don't know if I'm ready to trade in I forgot what she said. So trade in something for feeling like the grass under my feet was like the one like clearly phenotypically woman of color in that entire conversation. And so, I mean, not that I have any like insight into that narrative, but it did make me think about just like how those sociologies are kind of spinning around all this. And so then at the end of the day, I mean, this is fascinating. I don't use a lot of technology may work. I'd like to if it was more accessible, but given like what's immediate and important for me right now, like making ends meet and getting my shit out there, like I almost wonder why I care in a very crude way. You know what I mean? No, I, I understand exactly. Um, you know, it's, it's like as we've gone through life, we go, okay, we have so many choices, we can do whatever we want. But then there's days that I go, I have no choices. My choices are so limited by the marketing firm that it's saying, you like yellow and you're gonna like this box of Wheaties or whatever, right? And so that blank slate that I was as a baby is, is becoming more and more and more limited. As technology advances and, and the marketing firms aren't only telling us what colors we like, but telling us what we're thinking because we're engineered further and further, that scares me even more. So that makes that blank slate even smaller and smaller and smaller. So I'm very concerned about those things. I don't have an answer to your question other than to you know just be aware. Yeah. I just sometimes get a little frustrated in this kind of conversation about um, 
the idea that what we're really creating is something that's an other consciousness, where it seems like to me what we're doing with technology is really expanding, creating our own new version of our own consciousness. And that it seems like as long as we're uh, talking about physical hu human beings deeply in attached to the brain, it won't matter if we're ever able to reproduce the brain in its full uh, capacity if it's not really as deeply embedded with a physical body. Uh, I, maybe these are two separate things, but I, I always tend to think that uh, the way that perhaps we reach some new level of consciousness is really through the consciousness we have as extended by the technologies which allow us to interconnect in so many different ways with the rest of the physical world. Absolutely. It used to be thought that there's going to be greater than human intelligence when we build machines that are smarter than us. And then over the last, I would say, decade or so, the thought is, no, it's not creating separate machines, but creating machines that are merging with us, part of us. Um, so there's the thought that people could live forever by first having their brain augmented, hooked up to another computer, let's say, and then the next paradigm would be then we won't even need our bodies, but our consciousness will live on on the silicon substrate. That's one way to look at it, and that line of thinking then, sure, we are just a continuation of ourselves, but there are some people that are building machines that are supercomputers that are just in and of themselves a separate entity, and one day they might be smarter than us or wake up or become conscious and have an idea of taking over the world. I, I don't know, because it, it's not here. One of the greatest things for me about making this film was, as I said, I started this about 10 years ago. I started shooting about six years ago and editing about four years ago. Now I'm done. In 10 years, so much has happened. You all see the technology around you have changed, has changed, and you see it in the newspaper, or you know people involved in technology. But making my film, nothing has really changed. It's still out there, this thought that maybe this will happen. And so for me, I've been really lucky because nothing's, it hasn't happened. Is it even going to happen? I, I don't know. Maybe Jer Jerome can help us and tell us, uh, you know, if, if this kind of thing is going to happen. Uh, but I, I don't know. I, I'll always tell you I don't know. You know, it's interesting as you're asking that question, I um, got thinking about this idea within art of virtuosity. So we're like, we're like all amazed that the computer, this is this whole thing came about, right? Because we're like so amazed the computer can move so fast. So then we begin to equate that with intelligence. So it must be as smart or smarter than human. So it's becoming smarter and smarter and smarter. It's actually just becoming more virtuosic, which as artists, we like admire virtuosity sometimes, but we, but we also see that as, well, it's just a million turns. Right? It's, there's no meaning there. There's no idea there. There's no human humanity there. And I think that's the piece where we're, the, the conscious, that's why the consciousness piece resonated with me a little bit. It's like, that's the bit that's missing. And that's a part that I wonder, can, is it possible to create, is it, is it possible to create that? Because it's possible to be a virtuosic dancer doing a million spins and never, ever, ever make a, an emotional statement, a human connection, a, uh, you're just like a, a spinning top, and that's admirable, but not, but not artistic. Like yesterday uh, and the day before on Google's homepage, they had the guitar, the Les Paul guitar thing, and, and that's really cool. But what was cool is that I got to do it. You know, it was what I brought to the table, not just that Google created that guitar on their, on their homepage.